Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today I've got this Galco, it's actually a Jules Racine Company watch, uh, marketed under the Galco name that I found at a pawn shop. Um, I bought it pretty cheap. It's not worth a lot. These watches are just not worth that much. Um, you know, they're, they're not high quality watches, but this watch doesn't work. And I thought, hey, pawn shop, fine. Let's see if we can tear it down, get it to work and see how well it's built. So I'm guessing that this watch was probably produced in the 70s, maybe even the early 80s, judging by the manufacturing of the product. I mean, it's, it's really hard to tell. Uh, it does have a plastic dial, so you know that's a dead giveaway. And the watch itself is chrome-plated, it's not silver. And I'm just guessing, you know, mid-late 70s, possibly early 80s. And this is a, an interesting version of the stopwatch. It's not a one-minute stopwatch. It's actually a 30-second stopwatch, which means every rotation of the second hand is uh, 30 seconds. And here you can see I'm trying to remove the hands, and um, these would normally come off a whole lot easier, except I think because of the condition of this watch, the fact that it's probably been sitting for 30 years, um, it was a lot, it was really seized up, and I did have a hard time getting the hands off, which I eventually got to um, later on as I uh, proceeded with cleaning the whole movement. So I did manage to get the dial off. Um, it did come off with the second hand attached. I was able to get the micro counter off and I proceeded to flip the movement over and start disassembly. Now I'm not expecting much from this watch. Again, it's not the highest quality. It is from the 70s. It was made for a specific reason, obviously, uh, if it has a 30 second timer on it. And we're just gonna pull off the balance here and put that aside in the parts tray. Um, balance is a pretty stiff hairspring, um, lightweight balance bridge I was kind of unimpressed by that but the uh, you can see the pallet fork bridge here is pretty stiff it holds the pallet fork really firmly in place and there wasn't any play on the pallet itself we'll just pull that off and we'll put these in our parts tray So one thing about these jewels and racine watches is they these these stopwatches have a double a hack on them, which means you have a balance hack and a gear hack, which locks the whole movement in place um, in two places so that the when the watch stops, it stops perfectly. Um, that's a really nice feature. And here you can see as I'm disassembling the ratchet gears, uh, there is a whole lot of dried oil on this. I mean, it's just absolutely disgusting. This watch was probably just sitting, uh, I'm guessing for 30 years, unused. Surprisingly, it's in very good shape, uh, other than the dried grease and the dried oil. Now remember that first ratchet is a reverse thread, the second one is regular thread, and we'll pull that barrel winding gear out, which exposes us to the bridge plate, and you can see here the oil that was used on this particular watch. Uh, it doesn't look original. It looks like somebody had actually serviced the watch at some point in time, I'm guessing you know, 30, 35 years ago, and just really over-oiled it. I'm going to get the ID plate off. This is a serial number for this particular model of watch for Galco. It's not the serial number of the watch itself. Now we'll move on to the bridge screws here. This is a three-quarter plate bridge. Uh, three screws hold it in place. And we'll just pop those off and get that bridge off. Once we get the bridge off, you can see we've exposed the train. There's the four gears there that are typical of a stopwatch of this era and the mainspring barrel. Uh, you can see I'm still having a hard time getting these gears out. We're gonna pull it off a little bit at a time here. Once I get the gears off, then we can kind of examine the whole watch itself and see how it's working here. Now you can see the post for the micro second hand is still attached to the uh, gear or the second hand gear on that particular movement it's not really the second hand it's the micro gear and i just have to pry that off it comes off very easy the hand came off extremely easy on that particular piece and we'll just put that aside get it ready for cleaning and this gear and you can see here is just pretty much frozen in place with dried grease 
So I'm not gonna use dry grease when I put this back together. I'm gonna use a, a good quality watch oil. Um, I just prefer to do that. I think it'll hold up a little better under certain conditions. Well, here's a good time to look at the mainspring barrel. The mainspring barrel's uh, got a lot of dried grease on it and it's just filled with gook. And you can see that, unfortunately, the condition of the case manufacturing allows a lot of debris um, to get into these. However, these Stopwatches are typically used outside. They're not used indoors for the most part. So, you know, they're going to get dirty. They're just exposed to a lot of elements, uh, heat, humidity, dust, debris. And you can see it builds up uh, over time. And if you use a low-quality mainspring grease or uh, low-quality oil, you can see what you end up with after a few years of just sitting around. And pulling out the spring and examining the inside of the barrel, we're gonna we're gonna soak this for a long time, get it all cleaned up, and I am actually gonna polish and retemper this mainspring because I can't find one that's actually the same uh, denison strength. So rather than rack my head over where to order it for a watch that's only worth about thirty dollars, I think I'm just gonna polish this up. And with the mainspring cleaned and the barrel all cleaned, it's time to get it all reassembled. Just give it a little dab of mainspring oil. And that's what I'm using here, mainspring oil on this. It's in good shape. I mean, it's, the spring's not that old and it hasn't been run for a long time. Thank God it was left in the unwound position and not in the tightened or wound position as the spring really kept its tension. So finding information on Jules Racine and company is kind of hard. I mean, there's not much information on the company itself. I think it is part of the Galley Watch Company, and the Galley Watch Company and the Racine uh, Watch Company are actually owned were owned by cousins in the 1800s, and I think they were just distributed uh, under different brands. Uh, that's what I'm guessing. So if anybody knows the facts of this, just put a link in the description below because I'm sure some people would be interested. So one thing I learned about this particular brand of watch, uh, especially from this, ver this era of manufacturing, is these bridges and plates were used by several different movements. So you had, you had actually uh, watches, pocket watches made by Racine and Company using the same bridges and plates as the stopwatches. However, there were different pinions in different locations for the different gearing of the watches, whether it was going to be a stopwatch or a pocket watch to keep time. Again, assembly is pretty easy and it goes pretty smoothly on these. Um, when I assemble a watch, I usually put a screw, one of the screws back in the plate and I will uh, tighten it down maybe about halfway so that it holds the bridge in place and that way I can line up the gears with the pinion. Yeah, once all the gears are set in their correct pinions, then I'll go ahead and tighten down the bridge screws and put everything back in place. Getting those bridge screws put in place in this particular watch was very easy. The watch is in good shape, surprisingly. And here's an example of the dial. It is a plastic dial. And you can see if you reverse it, 
It's a stopwatch on one side and a clock watch on the other. So it looks like it was just double use. Um, they use the same parts for multiple models of watches. Here we're getting the pallet fork put back in and it is keyed. However, it's got a strange key system to get it seated correctly. You can see there's kind of, instead of little posts to hold it in place, it has little notches in the uh, bridge that, or the plate that holds it in place. And of course, every time I work on these watches and do a video when I'm talking about it, guys, I always tell you how delicate the pallet fork is. It is very delicate. So here you can see I'm using a dry oiler and I'm just seating it correctly. Once I get that pallet fork seated correctly, I'll screw the bridge in place and that locks in the pallet fork. So here you can see I'm just manually testing the stopwatch to see if the articulated gears all work correctly. And you can see up in the uh, it, my left index finger, the hack was actually moving back and forth. And that's the gear hack, not the balance hack. So I apologize for the off screen part of this. I'm putting on the uh, ratchet wheel for the mainspring barrel and we'll put that back in place. This is a regular right hand thread. So we'll get that keyed in. And of course the main ratchet here for the crown, that is a reverse thread. So I'm just gonna back it off, make sure it's threaded correctly, and then tighten it up. Do not over tighten these, and when you're taking them apart, assume that that gear has a reverse thread screw holding it in place, um, but just do it very gently because you just never know. So here we get the balance back in, and you can see it takes right off. That's kind of a good thing here. And once I make sure that the balance is seated correctly in its upper and lower jewels, we'll just tighten up the balance bridge with the balance screw there. Real quick, I just want to show you the two hacks. This is the balance hack here. And on the upper side of the full plate here, we've got the gear uh, hack, which actually puts pressure on the main gear and stops the main gear from turning. So a double hacked movement, this allows for a more accurate start and stop of the watch. And I'm just gonna put the ID plate back onto the watch. So now is a good time to start assembling this watch. I put the uh, two hand holders in place. These pinions hold the hands. Uh, they will allow the watch to be reset. You can see that they are keyed. So when we reset the watch by pressing the reset button, they actually reset to the zero position on the stopwatch. And when we put the stem back in, we can start and stop the watch movement. Get that in the right place. Then when we push it in, we get the start, and then when we push it in one more time, it'll stop. And of course, we're off to the timing machine. A lot of people think I don't time watches. I do, I just don't show you. It takes uh, anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes to time a watch accurately, especially these old vintage watches that are not high quality. So I don't always video record them. But here we are adjusting the timing of this particular watch. And for all of you guys who wanna know about how these watches work, under the dial, here you can see how everything is reset. And if we do the start and stop functions, how everything functions below the dial. So you can see the operation of a particular watch like this. So by inserting the crown and stem, I can start and stop the movement. And you can see the articulation of all the gears and the springs and how everything works in particular order to reset, start and stop the watch movement. So one thing you'll notice is that there's a little bit of damage to the dial. 
Um, it looks like because it's a plastic dial, it looks it looks a little bit like it shrunk over time. And you can see uh, over to the right side of the dial, it had a little chip in it. And that's actually a piece of plastic that broke off. So I had to make some adjustments to that. And I got it seated correctly because one of the problems being that it shrunk, it was putting some pressure on the hand holders or the hand pinions and that would not allow the watch to run. That was part of the problem with this particular watch. So here again, I'm just gonna run through the operation or the mechanic operations of the stopwatch. So as I mentioned before, the dial has a little chip in it, which means it's not going to be held in place by the dial post. So what I'm doing here, I'm using a little dial dot or a double-sided dial sticker, which will hold the dial in the one position that it needs to be held. It does have one uh, good spot where the post holds the dial in place, and that little double-sided tape is going to hold it in place on the opposite side, keeping the dial firm in position. Those come off pretty easy, so if you ever have to resurface these watches, they do unstick. Um, but they allow the dial to sit properly with no dial feed or anything like that. So now it's time to get the hands on. And here you can, put, you can see I'm putting the micro hand on. And what I'm going to do is hold the reset button down so that the posts stay in the reset or zeroed position while I gently put the hand in the right place. Now it's just a matter of lining it up at the zero position, pushing it down on the hand post, and then we'll give it a quick test and make sure that it all resets just like that. Then it's on to the second hand, in this case, the half second hand. And again, we'll hold the reset button down so that the hand posts are in the correct position. I'm just gonna gently hold that hand in place with my finger while I push down on it and then I can seat it properly. Then it's just a matter of testing. So this is a good time for me to let this particular watch run. I want to let it go for a few hours and just make sure it keeps time. The spring winds down correctly and everything works good. And I believe that these particular watches, this is a 30 second stopwatch, which means one rotation of the uh, second hand is uh, 30 seconds and two rotations would be a full minute. Um, this is a rare version of this particular watch, the way it's geared. Most of these, I'd say 99% of them, were distributed as one-minute uh, rotations instead of a 30-second rotation. And I don't think it really adds to the value of this particular watch. Just because it's rare doesn't necessarily mean it's more valuable. And I just want to let it go and let it run. It's keeping really good time. So for the quality of this particular watch, I'm kind of happy with it. Well, we'll just get it all back together. I'm going to let it run on the bench for a little while and see how well it does. It seems to be working pretty good. Um, at the time I did this video, and of course, now that it's been a few days since I've done the video on this, the watch has been running pretty good. It, it does run for quite a few hours to get to an unwind. I'm, I'm impressed with that. Again, these watches are not very valuable, so, you know, what do they sell for? Typically, the one-minute rotation stopwatches will sell between 30 and 50 dollars depending on their condition um, this does have a little damage to the dial unfortunately and it is a 30 second rotation so i'm not exactly sure what it's worth i can't find any information so again if you guys have any information on these particular watches again put a link in the description below or let us know so that we can have some information on these Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing as I do more watch and blender jewelry design videos uh, over the next few weeks. I'll be doing a few more. I've got some really great watches coming up that I've recorded and I have to do some video editing. I think once I uh, test this for a day or so, I think I'm going to chase my wife around the house and see how long it takes her to do things. Kind of drive her nuts. I'm sure she won't get too mad at me.